Nice maybe. fluorescent. You okay with that? <laughs> yeah, that might help. Okay. Is this how I did it? I don't know. I'm I'm okay with it. Okay. I'm okay with it. Okay. Let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so let us go. Uh, we have a bad day and we are very happy to have Christy here uh, uh, disregarding the weather and everything flying through. So she, she's from uh, uh, California, Davis, and uh, I just learned that that is the new name of, of uh, University of California, Berkeley. So, so Berkeley uh, uh, was renamed, uh, renamed to Davis. Uh, she's from uh, uh, University of Wyoming undergraduate, and after that, she, she got uh, uh, very good postdoc positions, I guess, in Arizona and uh, Stanford. And uh, right now she has this nice position also. And you have uh, interesting hobbies and uh, interesting topic. So please. Thank you. Thank you for that really nice introduction. So, and thank you all for showing up despite the weather outside. So, and I apologies for the blue here, but what I'm going to talk about in this talk, and a lot of you in this department are very familiar with this, but I'm going to talk about 2D layered materials. And this is an example, this is an example of business selenide, and you'll be seeing this one a lot throughout this talk. All of these materials, they consist of a series of covalently bonded layers that are held together by these van der Waals gaps, and you can put things inside of these van der Waals gaps. There's a high degree of anisotropy in these materials. So, and it's a huge class of materials. So we've got all sorts of different ones, of course, graphite, from which you can make graphene. Ones that you'll see in this talk, molybdenum disulfide, silicon telluride, which is one that we make in my group, and molybdenum trioxide. Now, throughout this talk, I'm going to talk about these three that are right on the top a lot. If you take a nap and fall asleep and miss where I'm at, up in the corner, I put a little crystal structure up there so you can, you know, kind of like following the bouncing ball. Now you can follow the crystal that's sitting up on the top. So, you know, these materials are really hot right now, and this is a really exciting area of science. But the thing about 2D and layered materials is these are the single most applied materials in your life today. Right now, you are using them all the time. You're encountering them on a daily basis. Layered materials are extremely important. And I'm going to talk about, I'm going to just give you a couple examples. This one's my favorite. This is bentonite. This is a magnesium aluminum silicate. You can see it's got the layered structure. Trust me, you've used this material. You're very familiar with it. This one, by the way, it's also one of the biggest exports in the United States. We export 3.8 million tons of this per year. Texas, right here, is one of the biggest exporters of this mineral, bentonite. It's also called sodium montmorillonite. It's used That's right. It's used in cat litter. <laughs> You do recognize that, right? That's cat litter. Yeah, so you can see this layered material. How, why does cat litter work so well? Well, you've got this van der Waals gap that basically acts as a site to hold all of your cat's pee, and it expands to hold the cat urine. And there you go, you have bentonite. It's also found, you're gonna love this. Mind blown, yes, it's found in yogurt. So if you look on the package, the, the package of your yogurt, you'll see magnesium silicate. Um, that's it right there. Yeah, so every time you're eating your play, you're actually eating a little bit of kitty litter. But <laughs> this is the greatest material, and let me tell you why. It's that as you're eating this, it's got these layers, right? And these layers slide up against each other. So it basically acts as a solid lubricant for your mouth. It's just clay. It's magnesium aluminum silicate. It's just dirt. But yeah, it acts as a nice solid lubricant, and so it makes the yogurt feel, taste pretty good. It's also found in salsin blue. This is one of the prime ingredients in salsin blue. Do you know what takes your dandruff out? All of these layers have a slight charge on it, and that slight charge will stick to the dirt in your hair, or the dirt, the dandruff, and it just pulls it out as you wash your hair. And that's what makes salsin blue so effective. 
It's used as a flocculant in wine. It's used in Pepto-Bismol. It's one of the most useful materials out there. Of course, graphite's another example layered material. As you've gotten ready to take your exams, number two pencil. It's got some graphite in it. Solid lubricants, graphite. The oxides, these are found like lithium cobalt oxide. Layered materials are all over batteries for energy storage. They have the Van der Waals cap in which you can put all of those different materials. The calcogenides, Peltier coolers tend to be made out of calcogenides, like this example of bismuth selenide. Boron nitrite, although this is an extremely ultra hard material, it's also ultra expensive, which means it's only found in cosmetics. So, ultra expensive cosmetics. Now, what you can see, what's common with these materials and what makes them so important is that they can intercalate things. They can hold things like cat urine or the dander from your hair. They have this van der Waals gap. So you can put different species inside of the gap. Because I'm in Texas, I'm gonna tell a story, an intercalation story. And this is probably one of my favorite Texas stories. Let me set the scene for you. It's 1900, it's about Christmas Eve. Captain Anthony Lucas is out drilling in Texas. And where he's at is this place that looks like here. This is Spindletop, Texas. It's not too far from here. So Spindletop, Texas, you know, at the time everybody was drilling all over Texas. There's got to be oil in here. We've got to get to it. The thing is, at the time, lubricants didn't exist. There were no such things as solid lubricants. So what would happen is you'd get to a certain depth and your drill would start to sing. Basically, it'd heat up and it'd start singing and singing and singing. As soon as it started to sing, that was kind of one of those indications that this is, everything's gonna go bad. Basically, your drill would just completely fall apart. It'd kill all of your men. It'd destroy all of your work. Everything collapsed. So it's 1900. It's actually Christmas Eve. Anthony Lucas is out there, Spindletop, Texas. And, you know, he's drilling. He knows there's oil on Spindletop. He knows it. He keeps drilling and he's drilling and he's drilling. Then he starts to hear the sing. And the sing gets louder. He's desperate. He doesn't know what to do. It's a little bit rainy in Spindletop. Probably not this rainy, but it was rainy on that Christmas Eve in 1900. And there were cows out here and they had munched up this bentonite, in fact, this nice clay out there, and they'd munched it up. Anthony Lucas is desperate. He doesn't know what to do. So he goes out and he starts grabbing this stuff and he starts throwing it down the borehole. And he just keeps throwing it down, throwing it down. And the drill starts to get quiet. It stops singing. And so he keeps at it. He keeps at it and he keeps at it, keeps throwing it down, keeps throwing it down. January 1st, 1901. This is Texas. I don't have to tell you what happened. He struck oil. Kathleen Anthony Lucas forever changed the course of U.S. history and the energy industry. And why did this work? Well, there were cows out there, there's bentonite here, and there was water, and the water intercalated into layers, making this the perfect solid lubricant. So yeah, layered materials have already changed the course of U.S. history. They've been a critical element in energy technology since the very beginning. So now let's get on to the, the science. Oh, but let me show you. I'm actually from Wyoming, which is also another sister state where a lot of this bentonite comes from. And this is a picture maybe about five miles from my home. This is a bentonite pit. This is what they look like. So the bentonite's just sitting there right in the mud. Okay, let's get back to today. Today now we can take these layered materials, graphite, bentonite in fact, all of them, and we can slough off the layers using scotch tape and we can get a single molecular monolayer which of course received, ended up uh, on the path to receiving a Nobel Prize and of course has changed a lot of technology and is changing science. So my group in particular, we have three different questions and the three questions we're asking is, can we come up with new 2D materials and can we come up with ways to chemically tune these 2D materials? What new fundamental physical behaviors can we create through chemically tuning these two-dimensional materials and what applications can we improve? So let me start by showing you some chemistry and let me give you an example. So this is silicon telluride. This is Si2 to E3. It looks like this. This is work by a former postdoc and my graduate student, Meng Jing Wang and Sean Kalayan. So you can see with silicon telluride, it's, this is, we, can, we grow it. We can grow it as these nice flat platelets that are large silicon P-type crystals. They have a trigonal crystal structure. We can grow them standing upright like this so we can access the Van der Waals gap. They're only about 50 nanometers thick. Or we can grow them as nanowires. They're highly single crystalline. 
The way we grow it is using vapor liquid solid me mechanisms. This is a large area of vapor liquid solid. So we can take silicon telluride, we put it in a boat. Upstream we'll put, put tellurium powder. We heat up the silicon telluride to about 800 degrees, which heats up this tellurium powder. The tellurium powder downstream will deposit a tellurium seed. And this tellurium seed acts as basically a catalyst through the vapor liquid solid mechanism where the silicon telluride will go into the catalyst and you can grow out nice plates. If you have a bare substrate, you can grow platelets that are standing up. And so we get a lot of these silicon telluride. So we make a whole bunch of different materials and this is one example of them. It's got a photoluminescence at 641 nanometers. Despite the bright blue, you can actually see that here. It's basically glowing. And we can take this material, we can see it's got different photoluminescence depending upon whether it's laying flat or standing upright. The nice thing about silicon, and especially silicon telluride, is you can start to do some fun chemistry with it, just like with silicon chemistry. So we can take a crystal, we can dip it in water, which you're forming is now a tellurium and a silicon oxide coating. We can cook off the tellurium and we have these perfect red platelets and that are coated with a, t a silicon oxide coating. So silicon telluride is going to hydrolyze. It's going to form hydrogen telluride and of course silicon. So by just doing this, putting on a protective oxide layer, now we could actually have an oxide layer that we can start to, to do some um, nanofab etching, you name it, and it protects our crystals. And just like Gaiman Novoslav, we can use scotch tape and we can exfoliate it down to a single layer. We also make materials one other, a couple other different ways. I'm just going to give you one more example. So this is molybdenum trioxide, and you'll see this one also throughout the talk. So it's a nice layered crystal structure. It's got these oxygens that sit inside of the van der Waals gap. We can grow nanowires of it using hydrothermal growth. So we'll stick molybdenum and hydrogen peroxide in a par bomb. We heat it up, 100 degrees C, four hours, and out comes these beautiful nanorods. We can change it into really large extended crystals using a new mechanism, which is basically water vapor transport. So we now put the molyoxide nanoribbons inside of a tube furnace, we close off the ends, and we use the water vapor that's trapped inside of these dried up nanoribbons to transport downstream in this quartz tube. So these are the crystals that we can get, and we can get these very large grown crystals. This entire growth mechanism takes about 30 minutes to get big, giant molyoxide crystals. This is an example of one that's 20 microns. You can see the difference in scaling. So we can really scale them up. Okay, so I've shown you so far how we actually make these materials. And you'll see a whole bunch of different two-dimensional materials throughout this talk. But what we're really interested in is developing chemistries to make these materials chemically tunable. And what our, my group has developed is we've developed a chemistry to intercalate high densities of zero valent metal atoms. We can basically put an atomically thin sheet of metal completely filling up the van der Waals gap inside of one of these host materials. We can effectively double the number of atoms in a host system. So in this example of bismuth selenide, we can go from Bi2 Se3 to Cu 7.5 Bi2 Se3. I'll show you this. And we can do this chemistry with all sorts of different materials. So all of these different elements. And I've been working for a long time to try to figure out how to get all of the elements of the periodic table in. And this is what we've gotten so far. Of course, the first zero valent metal intercalated into any t layered material was done with uh, mercury. And this was done by the Glounsinger group at Arizona State back in 92. And of course, it makes sense. You can dip something in mercury. The mercury is going to intercalate in. It's a liquid metal. It'll go straight in. What we've developed are a whole series of chemistries to intercalate zero valent metal atoms. So we can do this using a decomposition of zero valent coordination compounds. This is an example of dicobalt octocarbonyl. Basically, we pull off the carbonyls, the dicobalts go in. We can perform a disproportionation redox reaction. This is an interesting one from the nuclear literature, actually. So you can turn germanium bromide into germanium zero and germanium Br4 and this germanium zero will intercalate into the layered host. Or a tin chloride reduction, so if the electrochemical redox potentials are such that you can uh, reduce your species, you can take bismuth chloride, for example, add in some tin stannous chloride, you'll get bismuth zero, which can go into the host, plus then SNCl4. So these are just some basic chemistries. I'm going to show you an example to start off with, with just copper. So this one's my favorite of all of them. And this is just copper. So traditionally, how do people do this? Traditionally, they do electrochemistry. They run a battery. Batteries have a problem. One, you can only move ions. 
ions repel each other. So you can only put a certain number of ions in until they start to repel each other. And what happens when you've loaded up a layered material with ions? Those ions start to interact with the host and they explode the host. They basically destroy the host when you put too many in. So you have a limit of how many ions you can actually put into a crystal. That's a bit of an issue. So our chemistry works by just doing this in solution. You just do it in liquid. And we can put high densities of zero valent metals. And because they're zero valent, you can put as many as you'd like. You can see this is really easy too. You can even get rid of this reflux column if you'd like and do it in 10 minutes. But you can, <laughs> you can set up a reflux column. So basically you have just this bismuth selenide nanoribbons as an example or some other two-dimensional layered material sitting inside of this pot at 52 degrees C. We do a disproportionation redox reaction of copper. Believe it or not, you learn this one in, in general chemistry. So copper plus one disproportionates to copper two plus and copper zero. So we use this salt, tetrakis acetonitrile copper hexafluorophosphate. That's a copper plus one salt that's air stable. You can also use copper iodide. That works just as well. We do this at a pH of about 5.5 to 6.3, which is very close to neutral, but not quite, just so that we get as much copper zero as possible. And that copper zero will actually go in. And why does it work? It's done very dilute in solution. So if you have a concentrated amount of copper zero, you're going to form a nanoparticle. So it'll aggregate and it'll just drop out of solution. As you can see in this example down here. If you do this very dilute, so you basically are creating one zero valent atomic species at a time, Thermodynamically, it's not favorable to have just a single atom sitting out in a solution, so it's more favorable for it to intercalate into the host, and that's exactly what it'll do. It'll intercalate into the host, and we can keep uploading the host by doing this dilute in solution. So let me show you that this, actually, actually first let me show you how we get it back out. So that we can get it in through a disproportionation redox reaction. We can pull it out using a comproportionation redox reaction, which you do not learn in general chemistry. But you can take copper zero, add in copper two plus, and you get out a copper plus one. It's just the reverse. All you have to do is you, this is only takes about an hour. You just drop the substrate in a solution of acetone with a two plus salt. You wait a few minutes, wait an hour, all of the copper zero will come out. It works because of the Gibbs free energy of having copper plus in solution. So notice this has a low negative Gibbs free energy. This means the copper atom is gonna be pulled out. Whereas this high Gibbs free energy means it's gonna stay in. Okay. Let me actually show you that this works. This is real, this is true. Here's the, over here we've got the control experiments. This is just bismuth selenide. This is copper intercalated, or this is, sorry, this is copper selenide, C-U-S-C, -C, so 50-50 copper selenium. Look how teeny tiny this copper peak is compared to the selenium. And this is 50 atomic percent, right? Yeah, here is copper intercalated bismuth selenide. Look at how big this copper peak is. This corresponds to 60 atomic percent of copper intercalated into the ribbon. You can see there's no copper on top of the surface. It's actually intercalated inside. And I'll show you a little bit more about that. Now I mentioned we can get much of the periodic table so far, a lot of different metals, and you can see them right here. Here's a bunch of them, just plotted up. Platinum, manganese, and you can see from the EDX spectra this tells us. EDX spectra tells us there's copper, the metal, platinum, bismuth, chromium, you name it, you can see the different colors. There's no dependence on the sample size. We can use big giant crystals in this works. We can use little tiny powders, and this still works. This is just showing you how the bismuth to selenium ratio doesn't change. It means there's no reaction with the host, even though we're getting a lot of intercalant in. This is just an example with ruthenium. This is only about two atomic percent of ruthenium, but it's evenly distributed throughout the crystal. We can get up to about 10, 10 or 15 atomic percent of ruthenium. How do we know that it's zero valent? We can do eels, and we've looked at both nickel, and we've looked at manganese, and in this, electron energy loss spectroscopy, all you do is you compare the fine structure. Compare this guy, the actual data, to some standards. So there's copper zero, copper two plus, copper plus. Which one does it look like? Which one of these things is? Ah, yeah, it looks like copper zero. This is copper zero. We have copper zero metal sitting inside a layered host of bismuth selenide. Now, if you don't believe me yet, the best way to actually know that it's there is, can you see the atoms? Are they really there? So this is an example. We've got some maxines. They look like this, this structure up here, and this comes from Yuri Gagotsi's group at Drexel University. We intercalated the maxines with both tin and bismuth, and here's the maxine before, so the control experiment. 
These red dots indicate the tin and the bismuth. You can actually see the atoms using STEM inside of the layered host. Now, the interesting thing about these two examples of both bismuth and tin is they show both examples of intercalation, um, of nucleation of intercalation. So there's two ways that you can actually intercalate via the Dalmas herald mechanism where you form little islands inside of the crystals, just like with tin where you can see the islands sitting in here, or via the Rudorf mechanism where it'll fill up a single layer first and then it'll start to fill up another layer, as we see here with bismuth, which is unusual. I think this is the first example ever seen of a Rudorf mechanism in intercalation. Okay, how do we also know that it's there? Well, we saw the atoms, but now the host should actually expand as you put all of these metals, especially 60 atomic percent of a metal. And how do we tell that? We look at X-ray diffraction. So you can see with copper intercalated bismuth selenide, these peaks right here would be FCC copper. There's no FCC copper for the, the red ones. There's no FCC copper at all. We can also see a big shift, and you can see the lattice expands from 28.6 to 34.4, and we get the existence of these super lattice peaks. I'll talk more about those, but that's basically ordering of the intercalant inside of the host is where those super lattice peaks come from. It's fully completely reversible, so we can load it up with copper, and notice you've got the super lattice peaks here shown with the stars. We completely deintercalate it, the super lattice peaks disappear. There's a little bit of liquid that ends up left over, and so you'll get not a complete return to zero, but we get pretty close. And of course, it changes the color, it changes the transparency. Copper has a plasmon, so it'll make the, the crystal look kind of pink. It looks really pink with this nice blue color. But you can see before, it's a dark color. With the copper inside, you now see the copper plasmon, which gives it a reddish color and makes it actually more transparent. We pull out the copper and we can completely get it to return to its original color. And you can see some of these super lattice peaks that show up with the different uh, metals that we can get in. There is no dependence on either crystal structure or the unit cell volume, or the, no de de of the atom size or the, uh, the, the preferred unit cell structure of whatever the intercalant is, basically these are completely random, so we don't know 100% yet why these things, or what changes the, the expansion of the host in those materials. Now I mentioned that super lattices form with intercalation, so here's just an old example from the literature of, here's graphite, and here's antimony chloride intercalated in graphite. So what happens is the intercalant will actually order with respect to the host, and what you'll get are these super lattice patterns that are going to show up in X-ray diffraction or electron diffraction. So here's bismuth selenide before. Here is intercalated with 40 atomic percent of copper. You'll notice the super lattice that appears. When we fully deintercalate it, the super lattice vanishes. These are just electron diffraction images. We see the same with single crystal diffraction. So just to give you kind of an example, here's a copper intercalated bismuth selenide nanoribbon. We'll see those super lattice spots indicating the ordering of the intercalant. With copper at 60 atomic percent, it sits as a hexagon, and we know that inside it sits as a hexagon with a copper-copper distance of about 2.56. That's actually the copper-copper distance of a 111 FCC copper. And you can see this with all sorts of different crystals. So in cobalt, we've got what's known as the, in, the, the Bragg signature of an incommensurate charge density wave, the same with silver. I'll talk a little bit more about that a little later. With tin, we get a nice change in the, uh, basically, intensity of the spots, and we can determine how the tin sits in this crystal. Iron gives an interesting, just more kind of haze. In the different materials that you can put it in, so in indium selenide, you can see a unique super lattice spot. Niobium selenide, equally interesting super lattice. And silicon telluride, we get this nice, unusual super lattice spots. What we also get, so there's an interesting physical phenomenon that we can access through this. So I mentioned that was the Bragg signature of an incommensurate charge density wave in cobalt. This actually corresponds to a square root of 43A by square root of 43A lattice. So here is the... This is actually the incommensurate phase. Now the physicists, back in the 60s, they call this the stripey phase of a charge density wave. So this is the stripey phase of a charge density wave. It really looks like stripes, right? Yeah. So, and we get that for all of these other different materials. You can see the different stripe phases showing up in ruthenium, nickel, rhodium, and manganese intercalated bismuth selenide. So it's, it's interesting because you can't get charge density waves usually at room temperature. But these are at room temperature. They're showing up just right away. 
one of the things you can't do electrochemically is put in two different ions. People have been trying to do this using rocking chair batteries, so trying to put in sodium and lithium at the same time. It's doable, but it's very diff difficult. But one of the things we can do with this chemistry is we can intercalate two different atoms. And just to kind of show you this, and we can actually put two different atoms in the same host. So this is work done by my former undergraduate, Karen Chen. This is just to show you the huge amount of data that she collected. So she intercalated two different metals. So we've got one metal over here, and then the second metal over here. And she did this stepwise, intercalated them, and we collected all the different super lattice spectra that you can get. So we can basically create an alloy inside of a layered material. So now we have a high density, super stoichiometric alloy inside of this layered material. Here's just a couple examples of my two favorite patterns that come out of there. So with nickel and cobalt, you get a very unique ordered uh, incommensurate signature of the Bragg chart, the Bragg signature of the incommensurate charge density wave. And here's copper and iron intercalated, which is a really unusual pattern. And you can see again, the nice stripe phase that for example, shows up in indium cobalt intercalated bismuth selenide. Okay, so far what I've shown you is a new chemistry whereby we can intercalate high densities of zero valent metal atoms. And this should lead, to, and this leads to some unique structural properties. But now let me show you some of the hardcore physics, the more interesting physics that arises from some of these. And let me start with talking about phase transitions. So these intercalants themselves can undergo a phase transition. If they order with the host, they should be able to change ordering. And in fact, they do. This is an example of potassium inside of graphite. So you can see it has two different phases. So this is an example heating up copper intercalated bismuth selenide. There's your control experiment, always bismuth selenide, copper intercalated bismuth selenide. You'll see there's a disorder order transition at one point, and then it comes back to order, but we have a whole variety of different ordering. So my graduate student, Meng Jing Wang, shown up here, mapped out the entire phase diagram. So this is as a function of both concentration and as a function of temperature. And you have all of the different phases identified by their super lattice diffraction patterns in this type of material. This one's interesting, this one's unique. It's got lots of different phases. Here's cobalt. So she also did the same with cobalt. And you can see it's not so interesting. So this is the phase diagram. It has just one phase. That intercalant ordering will actually result in that stripe phase of the of that stripe phase of the charge density wave, but you'll also get a hexagonal phase. So this is consistent with a theory that's known as pokrovsky talipov theory. So it's incommensurate com crystal theory, which basically says that if you put a whole bunch of absorbates on a surface, they're either going to align in stripes or they're going to align in a hexagon. And there you have it. We either have the stripes or we have the hexagon, and you can see the phase transition between those two. So we get the stripey phase and we get the hexagon phase at the higher concentrations. Now, I keep saying these are charge density waves, but here's something that's unique about a charge density wave. So if you've got one and you put on an electric field, the atoms will actually unlock from the host and they'll start to move around. So what you're going to see, let me show you the control experiment because we always have to have that. That's kind of boring, right? There's nothing happening. This is just looking in a TEM. We're looking at bismuth selenide, and we're just watching it. Now, this is at room temperature. This is a stripe phase, and this is a hexagon phase. The beam is completely spread in the TEM. So it's as, hard, it's as wide as possible. But we have an electric field from the E-beam itself, and that electric field matches that for this copper that's sitting in this host, and we start to get a sliding charge density wave. So here you can see it completely unlocking and sliding around. Supposedly, these should also sing. So at some frequency, they'll actually start to make a sound. They basically sing. So you get singing charge density waves. OK. So intercalation can be used to modify some of these interesting properties. And be, so we can modify the intercalant itself. And we can see all the different phase transitions of the material. What about, what does it do to the host? I mean, you've just loaded this thing up with a ton of metal. How is this going to affect the host? Now, I'm going to give you one example on that order of phase transitions. So what we do is we like to look at things as a function of pressure. And we can get to very high pressures in a diamond anvil cell. And in a diamond anvil cell, we take a diamond, we lop off the tops, 
And pressure is force per unit area, so we put those tiny tops together and we get a very large pressure in between that very tiny area. So here you can see an example, there's some ruby chips. This is how we measure the pressure inside of the diamond anvil cell. This is actually the diamond cell we use. This is what's known as a, a, a Merrill Bassett diamond anvil cell. We fill these things up with our intercalated ribbons. I'm going to show you an example of silicon telluride and how these metals change the phase transitions of silicon telluride. Hopefully we can see it with the strange color. This is work of my undergraduate Virginia Johnson who just left for CU Boulder. So we have silicon telluride plates loaded inside of the diamond anvil cell. You can see them right here. There are arrows pointing to them. This is the Raman signature. You'll notice it's a bright red plate. Now there's a predicted phase transition to, from a semiconductor to a metal at around 9 or 10 GPA. You can see at around 9 GPA it becomes dark black. That tells us that it's a metal now. So it's gone from a semiconductor, a nice transparent semiconductor, to a metal. And when we go back down in pressure, it's fully recovered. Okay, so we can look at some of these different phase transitions, but now let's take silicon telluride and let's put an intercalant into it. So let's put manganese. So we put manganese into silicon telluride, and we chose it because the uh, work function of manganese is just above the valence band edge of silicon telluride, so you get just a little bit of dumping of electrons into there. So here is manganese intercalated silicon telluride. The plates are pointed out with the arrows inside of the diamond anvil cell. We take it up to 10 GPA. And you can see there's the plates before, and of course we see the same color change, and it recovers back to red. Well, let's actually plot this out so we can use Raman scattering. So when you have Raman scattering of a metal, it basically doesn't exist. There's no Raman scattering off of a metal, so we detect the Raman scattering from the silicon telluride. Here it is as a function of pressure. You'll notice it vanishes at about 9.5 GPA, plus or minus half a GPA. Here is manganese intercalated silicon telluride. You'll notice that we get a second peak that shows up. This is actually due to the EG mode instead of just the A1G mode. So we get a little bit of symmetry breaking so that we now see this peak. And of course the phase transition has changed as now it's 7.5 GPA. So we have made chemically tunable materials where we can change their phase transitions by a whole 2 GPA. And that's a lot of pressure. So that's a big change. So you can imagine if we could keep loading this up with different materials, we could maybe drop those phase transitions all the way down to really low pressures. One of the interesting things, so this by intercalating, we can reduce phase transitions in host materials, but we also see an interesting thing here where the slope of this guy goes negative. And this is an unusual example of negative linear compressibility where usually your Raman peaks always look like this. They always go in this up direction. But occasionally you'll see a material that does this where one of those Raman peaks goes negative. Selenium does this and it looks like silicon telluride does this. Some other dichalcogenides do it as well. And so that's just one of those interesting things. Okay. One of the other things that we're interested in is the acoustic phonons. And phonons, and the acoustic phonons in particular, acoustic phonons are sound. Yeah, so we're interested in that because phonons, they affect heat transport, they affect electronic transport, electrons constantly run into them, they also, they dictate the mechanical properties. So sound velocities in a material and how the phonons move in that material dictates the mechanical properties. So we study the phonons using a technique called Brion scattering and we're interested in how can we make chemically tunable acoustic phonons. And so Brion scattering, it's a really ancient spectroscopy Basically, it was invented in 1913 by this guy named Gross. And of course, so it should be called Gross spectroscopy, but because it uses the Brion scattering mechanism and people are wise, they call it Brion spectroscopy. Anyways, here's your Raman modes. Here are your Brillo and acoustic modes. So you've got one longitudinal and two transverse acoustic modes. And the way this works is much like Raman. We shine a laser on a surface, and what that laser does is launch a sound wave. And of course, it's going to be at hypersonic velocities, so really high, gigahertz range. We collect the scattered light off of it, and we can analyze that to determine the sound velocities, the stiffnesses, the mechanical properties, and we can get the entire elastic stiffness tensor from those measurements. So just like Raman, we have a Stokes scattering event and an anti-Stokes scattering event. There's no dependence on temperature for acoustic phonons. We can use this to map out the entire acoustic phonon dispersion relation. Here's just an example from a, an old paper by Quok et al, published in Carbon of graphite, where you can see the longitudinal and the transverse acoustic modes mapped out from the Brion modes. 
Okay. We do this using a scanning tandem Fabry Perot interferometer. It's also known as a Sandercock box. There aren't a lot of these in the world. It's a high resolution technique. So these are those moly oxide large crystals that I showed you before. This is work done by myself and my colleague Brian Reed at um, IDES, so in industry. So we took these materials and basically I suspended them on a substrate. They're intercalated, you can see intercalated with copper, intercalated with tin, and intercalated with cobalt. You can see the different color changes. We take this and we only put about two, two to five atomic percent of metal, so very little. We rotate the crystal, so we rotate what's known as the Q vector, basically the direction we're probing in this crystal, so we can probe the acoustic phonons throughout the entire crystal. And we get spectra that'll look like this. We can take those, so the reason why it looks so noisy, before I said we only get, we get two transverse and one longitudinal, well in a material that's two-dimensional, what happens is that the acoustic phonons are actually quantized. They don't move like they would normally move in a material, they don't move like a bulk. So now you have a surface, and how does that surface move? It basically moves like this. What you get are what are known as lamb waves and love waves. So here's kind of a picture to show you what they look like. So here's a love wave, and here is some of the asymmetric lamb mode, and here's an asymmetric lamb mode. As it says right here, the thickness is going to be less than the wavelength of light, so phonons in these 2D layered materials end up being quantized. All of these were chosen to actually be about 200 nanometers, and the wavelength of light I use is 532. And you can see all of those different peaks as they show up at different angles in this. So we can take this data and we can map out the entire acoustic phonon dispersion relation. And this is what it would look like. So a lot more complicated than the nice two transverse, one longitudinal mode. We can take this data and using a code that Brian Reed wrote, which is basically a lamb wave solver, we're able to extract out all of the mechanical properties. Now I'm only showing four different properties here, so I'm showing your bulk modulus, and I'm showing three of the elastic stiffnesses. And these are plotted in order of lattice expansion, and you can see as you put the different metals in, it changes the stiffnesses. So yeah, I actually get the entire stiffness tensor for this material, so all the C11, C C22, C33, you've named them. I've given a little picture here to kind of show you what this means with the crystal as how you would deform it in terms of what body forces we're actually measuring. So bulk modulus is interesting, there's not a lot of change. But these shear moduluses show a huge amount of change as you intercalate these zero valent metals. We can also, because we're using a lamb wave solver, we can actually start to extract out the thicknesses. So I, I mentioned that by eye, I chose crystals that were nearly all 200 nanometers. Here are the actual thickness of these. And we can actually measure the thickness within a layer in addition to all of the elastic stiffness tensors. Okay, so what I've shown you in terms of the physics is that we can get a plethora of different phase transitions and we can control phase transitions of host materials. Intercalation also alters the acoustic phonon and elastic stiffnesses of a material. Now, we're getting close to being running out of time, but I'm going to show you one last thing. I'm going to talk about application. And I'm going to tell you, a st well, you know, a lot of other groups have actually been doing pretty well. They've actually been grabbing this chemistry that the zero valent chemistry that I've shown you, and they've started to show some really exciting applications. So they've shown that by copper intercalating lithium manganate and by intercalating tin into molyoxide, you can extend substantially the cycle life of some of these batteries. You basically have now put in a metal, which helps the host stay solid, so it extends the cycle life. Uh, Burnicite intercalated with both copper and nickel shows both a two times enhancement of water oxida oxidation catalyses and a three times increase in stability of the material. And this was work done by Daniel Strongen at uh, Temple University. They've shown there's a four times enhancement of ZT for copper intercalated in bismuth telluride, so ZT is the thermoelectric figure of merit. You can get a four times enhancement just by intercalating this metal which makes sense, you change the acoustic phonons quite a bit, you also change the heat transport. Um, exciting work that was published by the Shui Group and NatureCom. You can get both ambipolar gating, you can get P-type heterostructures, N-type heterostructures, and all sorts of interesting things, and these were metal intercalated tin sulfide. Now, I don't do batteries. I wish I did, but I don't, and I don't do catalyses. But what I do love, and what I do have interest in, in terms of, of application, you see this thing? This is my car. This is a real picture of my car. This is my baby. This is my love. 
This is the pinnacle of American innovation. I know it's a little old at this point, but it's a 2010 Ford Mustang GT. Usually mine has a kayak rack on it, but you get the idea. This is the perfect car. There is nothing wrong with this car. This is the car that everybody wants. It's got a big giant engine in a lightweight body. It goes really fast, at least in a straight line. <laughs> Doesn't turn so well, but it's fast and it's powerful and it makes a lot of noise. This is everything. This is the perfect car. I love this car. I love everything about it, except for one thing. That thing. I hate that thing more than anything. This is the electrochromic mirror. A lot of you might have a car. Does anybody have a car that's got one of these things in it? Really, nobody has had to share in my pain. <laughs> this is just not fair. <laughs> this thing, you know how you've got that nice rear view mirror, you just tilt that little knob and it turns it up? This thing doesn't do that. Instead, this is an electrochromic mirror and it's basically got moly oxide, tungsten oxide, and a bunch of polymers in it. When you intercalate lithium in this case, because this is just a battery, and it intercalates lithium, and it changes from white transparent to this kind of nice light white blue. Well, that's the problem. It's not dark enough. It's not dark enough. And then you're driving down the road and somebody with one of those Mercedes with the bright yellow headlamps comes up and guess what? You can't tilt the mirror. So you've got the yellow that goes right straight through this blue color and right back into your eyes. Has another issue because this is a battery. The lifetime of your cell phone, what, you have to replace it every two to three years, right? Well, guess what else needs replaced every two to three years? This silly thing costs a couple grand to replace, $2,000. I would rather go buy a $25 little flip mirror, right? So you can see the problem with this. So when I started this faculty position, I was told you can change, you can fix any problem in the world that you have, anything, you can fix it. So I decided, I told my grad student, let's fix this problem. <laughs> Clearly it has more, more, uh, more impact than just fixing my own car. You can imagine you could make electrochromic and photochromic materials, smart materials by intercalating zero valent metals. And so we did it. There's Meng Jing. We took moly oxide, we intercalated zero valent metals, and you can see this is actual real data. This is a substrate of moly oxide. This is intercalated with metal. Uh, we basically are effectively adding states into the band gap. We decrease the effective band gap, which makes this a nice dark material. This is much darker than just intercalating this with lithium or water. And of course, we can pull it back out using hydrogen peroxide as an oxidative deintercalation, or even we can heat it up and have a, a phase transition from, ordered to, or from disordered to ordered. Okay, we can do this in solution, we can do this in acetyl nitrile, and Meng Jing did it over and over and over and over and over about 20 or 30 times until we showed, yes, it's completely reversible. And this is an example with cobalt. Tin, not so well, not so, it doesn't change the color back as well, but definitely cobalt's nice. Okay, so I complained about the yellow problem. To give you an example, this is moly oxide. I've intercalated a little bit of water so that it's still, it's a blue color, as it should be. There's why the yellow lights get right straight through. By putting in these different metal atoms of cobalt and tin, notice what happens. I decrease the effective band gap, and I've gotten rid of the yellow light issue. So yeah, and it works. It's easy to do this. We can do it in solution. It's totally non-destructive. So we did this in a couple nanoribbons. We did this in powder. We did this in big bulk crystals. Moly oxide, intercalated with tin, deintercalated, intercalated, again, 20 or 30 times, until my grad student said, no more. We're not doing this anymore. We're gonna publish the paper. And we're done, and yeah. So it's non-destructive, it makes materials darker, and it works pretty well. So let me go ahead and close up with this. So I started by showing you a new chemistry whereby we can intercalate high densities of zero valent metal atoms. And then I ended off showing you that we can change the chemically tunable phase transitions, the acoustic phonons, and thus the mechanical properties, and finally, that we can fix my Mustang. So let me give acknowledgments to my group. Most of these people have now graduated as of just this summer. They thought it would be funny to dress up like me. <laughs> and so, <laughs> with that, funding agencies, thank you very much for your time and attention.
but the host system that you showed was restricted to this, this one. So yeah. now, uh, that's the one I showed the most. Um, Can just you do this on molecular sulfide? Yep, it works very well. In fact, the molysulfide is a really interesting system. So we intercalated samples for Doran Neve in uh, Israel. And what he's been finding is that it's leading to a much higher photo detection. So he had us intercalate tin into molysulfide. So it has nothing to do with the spacing that you have. No, and that's what's interesting about molysulfide. So molysulfide in particular, it doesn't really like to intercalate, especially not organic molecules, and it's very difficult to get a lot of lithium in. Um, but for some reason, something as small as copper seems to go in pretty well. Well, I can tell you, having looked at samples that I've had sitting around for six years, they're at least stable for six years. Except for cobalt. When you intercalate cobalt into materials because it's magnetic, after about three years, it starts to look a little strange, but it's still intercalated. The super lattice peaks are not the same. Sorry. Are you marketing new materials at Ford for their European nerves? Say that again? Are you marketing your materials at Ford for their European nerves? <laughs> oh, I would love to do that. You know, yes, <laughs> I would love to do that. I hadn't even thought about doing that. What about the outside color of the car? The what? The outside. So then it would change color, <laughs> push a button and it intercalates zero valent metals. It does go pretty fast, within 10 minutes. So you can have 0.14 grams of copper in about five milliliters of acetone. 10 minutes later, it'll intercalate into 60 atomic percent. So you could do it. It would take still 10 minutes, but yeah. So uh, how did you measure the buff on this? So what we did, and this is what the LAM wave solver does, is so we have all of the different, so basically we know that this crystal structure is going to be, in this case, orthorhombic. And so we know what the stiffness coefficients are going to be for that. And so we just use the LAM wave solver. We take the Brion frequency shifts. Usually you turn them into a sound velocity, but we actually just turn them straight through with the, both the Pockels tensor and the, um, uh, the word is losing me now. Uh, we basically just perform the LAM wave solver and we can get all of these values out. So then um, once we have the full stiffness tensor, so we only get the C11, C22, C33, et cetera, et cetera, we take those values and we turn those into a bulk modulus. Is So the thing about nano indentation is when you do nano indentation, you have to worry about both the contact of the sample as well as with the material. And so sometimes if it gets stuck, of course you don't get accurate measurements throughout it. Other ways to measure bulk modulus are you put in a diamond anvil cell and you put it up to pressure and measure the x-ray diffraction and get the bulk modulus through an equation of state. So it's, I mean, it's different. So if you, so Brion scattering is very different in terms of, I mean, it's a laser. These are hypersonic frequencies. What you're getting out is the true stress, true strain. If you do dano indentation, you're actually, you're compressing the material. So you're actually getting out the engineering stress strain. So Brion scattering always gives values that are just a little bit higher than what you'd get through an, a compression test. Any clustering happens with this intercalated metal? Uh, this metal will cluster or not? Do the intercalated atoms in, in the, uh, inside the yeah. cluster together? Oh, as in trying to do them two at once? No, no, the question is whether the metals that are in between the layers, do they cluster or they form? So the it's, it's atomically distributed or, or how, there are how you from their distributed or whether they cluster? They have made some clusters. So they tend to form an island inside of the host until you've got it completely full. So at first you'll have islands that just sit with inside of the host and you'll get like big giant islands, you know, up to millimeter sized islands that are sitting inside of the host. And then of course, as you start to add more, you completely fill out the host and throw and so then by a staging, you've got it completely filled. And then you lose the islands. Mm-hmm. With the exception of bismuth. So bismuth doesn't appear to form islands. It appears to just go into a layer and just all keep filling up a layer. And then once it fills up a layer, it goes to the next layer and it fills up that next layer. So <coughs> what is the problem with the other metals? Seems you, you go through the periodic table. 
but, but uh, either you had no time to get through or, or, or some reason not to get through. So, so, so what, 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 what is outside? What's, help, what's stopping me? So, yeah. so far, I actually figured out titanium. I got titanium working. But the problem is, in each of those, I have to have some kind of a reaction that'll form a zero valent metal or a zero valent atom. And most of these, these are the ones that I can actually, I've been able, that are ways to form zero valent metals. The others, there are no ways to actually form a zero valent metal, at least not yet. So. so vanadium and tantalum, and these are kind of difficult. Well, there should be a way to do vanadium because there's vanadium carbonyl, and so you could make vanadium carbonyl and get vanadium as a zero valent metal. The hard part is nobody makes vanadium carbonyl because it's so dangerous. So, so any kind of complex you have, basically, it's a good step to... Yeah, if you can get an organometallic complex, so you can actually make a ligand that'll stabilize a zero valent metal, you could theoretically get all of them. Any other questions, guys? If not, let us thank again Christy for coming. Thank you very much.